So good morning and good afternoon, everyone, depending where you're located. Uh, welcome to the series, Viewing Multidimensional Poverty from Many Angles, coming to you virtually from Oxford, UK, New York City, and Washington, DC. I'm James Foster, representing the Institute for International Economic Policy, or IIEP, of the Elliott School of George Washington University, who, along with OFI and the Human Development Report Office of the UNDP, is bringing you today's event, the 17th episode in the series, entitled On Data Availability for Assessing Monetary and Multidimensional Poverty, presented by Sabina Alkire, the director of OFI, with discussion by Yan Chun Zhang, the chief Stati uh, of statistics of HDRO, and by Heriberto uh, Tapia, research advisor to the HDRO. In just a moment, I'll turn the podium over to Sabina, but first, I'd like to express my appreciation to the hardworking folks at IIEP who are producing this virtual event uh, for those for all, uh, this virtual online event. Indeed, this is one of the several series regularly produced by IIEP, all of which can be seen online uh, or in reruns on, on our uh, YouTube channel. They include Facing Inequality, an interdisciplinary conversation on this important topic and rethinking capitalism and democracy, which tomorrow at 9 a.m. Eastern will feature Mark Kenber and Kavita Prakash uh, Mani in a presentation entitled Governing the New Voluntary Carbon Markets. On Wednesday, our Envisioning India series continues with Sajid Chinoy contemplating India's economy in a post-pandemic world. Next week in this series, I'm slated to present a paper entitled Measuring the Statistical, Statistical Capacity of Nations, which is an application of the multidimensional measurement approach to evaluating the ability of countries, um, national statistical offices to produce the data needed for policy research and the SDGs. For these and other events, check out the website IIEP, GWU, EDU, uh, with dots in between those three words. And if you have to miss an event, check out the YouTube channel, IIEPGW. And now, without further ado, let me turn it over to Sabina for today's presentation. Sabina. Thank you so much, James, and thanks to all of you um, for joining and for being with us. Um, there's some times when you do quite grand work and you feel very proud of your findings. And then there's sometimes when you actually have to clean closets, when you have to do a little bit of digging around in the back cupboards and trying to organize yourself for work going forward. So this paper co-authored with Matthew Robeson is of the latter variety. It is not going to have any great findings, um, but it is going to try to see what is unorganized in the back cupboards of data for multidimensional poverty what would it look like to become organized um, and then show you just a couple tiptoes in that direction that we have done on existing data sets. So I'd like to begin by observing that the COVID pandemic has created a global setback in terms of data. So surveys that were in the field were stopped and new surveys in many countries have not yet been fielded and there has also been, therefore, an absence of up-to-date data and a shift to the remote rapid survey data collection techniques and a great deal of innovation in them. And this point is not just one point in time, but as we look historically across poverty series throughout the world, we will see that 2020-2021 are a breaking point in many of the existing data series that we have. And so it is a good point at which to stop and take stock of what we have in terms of data and also to learn from it and pause and think intelligently about what would be useful going forward and what um, small changes in data collection environments and techniques could create major changes in terms of the power of, for example, multidimensional poverty numbers, but also other kinds of analyses that draw on multi-topic household surveys. 
And I say that because at one sense, poverty data are often argued to be severely limited in terms of the frequency of their updating or in terms of the variables that they cover, not covering all of the variables, for example, recommended by Tony Atkinson in the World Bank Commission monitoring global poverty because violence um, and work, for example, are excluded from the common survey instruments that have data on the other dimensions he requested, like health and nutrition and living standards and education. So what we do in this pre-paper is to absorb, observe that before the pandemic, probably more data were collected than were used. But that one reason for that is the time and transaction costs it takes to figure out what data sets have the correct data for a given study. And so we term these entrance barriers and look at the entrance barriers that are created by a lack of curating data in such a way that it could be used for comparable studies, for example, on multidimensional poverty or related multidimensional phenomena. And then it catalogs and reviews um, a few of the data sets and starts to get a sense of really how difficult it would be to do those. And, um, but it does try to at least count the number of surveys by a certain definition that were available from 1985 when major internationally comparable surveys started until 2020, when this pause that will be visible um, in retrospect for years to come occurred. And really, in thinking through these issues, we draw a great deal on the work of Sir Tony Atkinson in the commission um, that released its report in 2016 on monitoring global poverty. And that commission, as you will remember, had an aspect focused on monetary poverty and an aspect focused on multidimensional poverty. And some of the analysis, which was as expected, um, focused on measurement issues. But a great deal of that report, which is perhaps underappreciated and under enacted, focused on data, data issues and issues in having comparable and accurate and credible data for poverty in both monetary and non-monetary forms. So he observed, for example, that many groups are missing from the global poverty account because they are systematically absent from household surveys, such as the homeless or the pavement dwellers, or those who live in institutions, whether it's military barracks or hospitals or asylum refuges or um, in monasteries. And so thinking about how to look particularly at the poorest groups, um, such as the pavement dwellers or the homeless, and include those in household surveys, which claim to have a bead on poverty, but overlook groups that are arguably among the poorest is essential. He also argued quite innovatively that whereas poverty numbers are regularly reported with sampling errors, that is with standard errors that reflect the sample design, there is a lack of attention to the total error approach, which not only includes missing populations, but also includes the non-sampling measurements errors of various kinds. And he advocated that there be an analysis of the total error approach going forward. And so the quality, um, the accuracy of different uh, surveys would also be considered. The report also argued, and in parentheses are the recommendations uh, of the report, which dwell on these topics, because the report made a number of recommendations, that it was necessary to make public the principles according to which household survey day uh, are selected, whether it is, for example, for the $1.90 a day measure or for the global multidimensional poverty measure. And he argued also that national governments should have a say in as to what those principles are, not just a single international institution. 
And because of the lack of frequency of traditional household surveys, the report advocated investing alternative methods of providing up-to-date poverty estimates. In particular, it looked at the SWIFT surveys, which we'll return to, of the World Bank, which were trying to gather um, co variables for which one could think of coefficients to predict income poverty, and also variables which one could be used to directly me measure multidimensional poverty between household budget surveys. And finally, explored the use of subjective assessments of a personal poverty statement um, status as a way of triangulating or understanding or deepening perceptions of poverty and basically augmenting that literature uh, so that it is very well understood how those questions occur. And so um, a first question is, it's now five years since that Atkinson Commission report that was launched in early November. And what questionnaires exist that have done each of these successfully? Where have we advanced in terms of meeting those requirements? And in particular, the focus of this paper is on multi-topic surveys because one of the recommendations was to investigate multi-topic surveys because these are part of the work envisaged for recommendations 18 and 19, which refer to the monetary, non-monetary indicators of global poverty. That is both a dashboard and a multi-dimensioned poverty indicator using the adjusted headcount ratio methodology. In addition to these particular recommendations that were um, named prominently in the Atkinson Commission report, there was also a call for investments in statistical capacity. And these uh, formed part three of the Atkinson report. And the requirements included extending the country coverage of household surveys and increasing their frequency and increasing the reliability because it focused on monetary measures also, for example, of commute, CPIs, computer price indices, but also in developing non-monetary poverty indicators, um, multidimensional ones, but he envisaged them also including violence and work. And also engaging participatory studies to obtain information about alternative poverty lines or the composition of indicators that were important in a non-monetary sense. And then naturally improving population figures where they were not census-based um, or where the post-census extrapolation was flawed. And um, also looking at limited consumption surveys. So again, for part three of a three-part report, this was an, a, a significant and cross-cutting uh, requirement for work going forward. And so it's a good point to think, is there an exhaustive account of successful examples of these? Um, in the realm of multi-topic household surveys. And I'll just give you a couple of, or remind you of a couple of things I'm sure you read in the report. Um, but there's an ex a need not just to have very, very large cross-cutting things of the surveys up updated every three years, or it has a measure of work in it, but to have the details. So he reminded us of the great Indian poverty debate when between 1989 and 1998, the National Sample Survey in India experimented with recall periods of seven days and 30 days for food and one year recall for infrequent purchases such as refrigerators. And the seven day recall raised expenditure on food by 30% and total consumption by 17%. And so when they used the seven day recall period, hundreds of millions of people fell into poverty overnight simply because that change. And so it's not a matter of just having gross information, but actually specific information about how a question is asked, the recall period, the response structure, because these details actually can matter a great deal. And it's a, a point of empirical interest how much indeed each of them do matter. Another example um, is the need to think about the number of items 
and the time they take. So here, the report was trying to refute the assumption that multidimensional poverty indicators, because they have more numbers of indicators, are more demanding in terms of household questionnaires. So the example that he gave is that the multidimensional poverty indicator, the official national MPI for Colombia, is based on 38 survey questions. For Pakistan, it's 54. And for Costa Rica, which has the most number of questions of any household survey as an official national MPI to date, it's 77. And for the global MPI, it's around 40. And he pointed out that the information required for consumption is typically more extensive, giving an example of Cambodia for 450, giving an example from Malaysia, but also pointing out that the number of questions included on consumption surveys often top a thousand. And so again, thinking about the consumption aggregate um, of a poverty measure would also mean looking actually at what is inside of it, how many questions, how much time does it take? And similarly for multidimensional poverty measures. So all of this leaves us with um, quite a long list of things to do. And so far, there's not, in a sense, um, much curating of the data sets. What tends to be done is to look at particular measures and to look at what they have managed to achieve. For example, if we consider the World Bank PovCalNet $1.90 a day measure, and if we restrict it to low and middle income countries where the data are of the window from 2009 to 2019 20, then there are um, 23 data sets that have data in 2019. And for the global MPI just released October 7th, there are 22 countries with data in 2019 or 2020. And if we look at the number of countries with data of 2015 or later, it's 77 for $1.90 a day and 74 for the global MPI. So that's an example of counting countries. Of course, we might be interested in the number of people who live in those countries, and we might be interested in other things, but that's an example of what is commonly done. Or to take another example, the $1.90 a day measure within that 10 year time period that matches the global MPI covers 115 low and middle income countries and 6 billion people. And the global MPI covers 109 countries of which three are high income. So 103 um, low and middle income countries, sorry, 106 low and middle income countries and 5.9 billion people. So that approach goes from a measure to compare the age of the data or the number of population covered. But it sidesteps the really important question is, are there more data out there that could be used either for these measures or for other studies? And I'm not really focused on the global MPI or uh, in, in this presentation, it's a, it's a more general question. Um, so when we talk of data curating, we talk of the need to look at multi-topic surveys. And by those we are defining when we count them, surveys that cover at least three dimensions of the commonly named dimensions of poverty um, and that are international if we want to focus on comparable data. And of course, it would be possible to focus on national data as well. There's also not an archive of comparable questions or the comparability of sample designs or of data quality and total error. Um, and of course, it, even if there were, in so far as there is, for example, on DHS website, um, it would be missing national household surveys or academic surveys, um, state level surveys, firm level data, regional surveys like Macovi uh, or UU Silk. And there's a further problem, which is also headlined in the Atkinson report, that OECD data are often curated differently than developing country data, which makes it very difficult, for example, to do an adequate measure of multidimensional poverty that might be relevant in Thailand, 
but also in Australia or in uh, other countries. And so this paper basically is just inviting us to take stock and to identify these gains and gaps. So what could we do if the data were curated, if we could, in a sense, dial up surveys that had certain characteristics? Here are a few examples of research topics that could be undertaken. And I'm not saying that they would be, but for example, one could look at other national surveys or labor force surveys or things in small island developing states that are perhaps um, missing existing, uh, uh, or haven't realized that they have or demanded that their data be used to make a, a comparable poverty measure, whether the global MPI or another. It would also be possible to think of other measures of poverty, but also of, of well being, uh, and to try to see what data might exist of high quality that can be disaggregated, that would have a well being measure or could have a linked well being and poverty measure, um, and which indicators would be feasible to include. And also, it might be that there are data sets every three years, but there might be a comparable data set in the middle um, that would be possible to use to update it. Um, and of course, there are many bespoke studies that would want to look across different countries or states or subnational regions at a set of indicators, not just one at a time, and, but to do it in a way that's strictly comparable. For example, it would be interesting to look at household level data, household survey level data on violence and poverty, or um, all countries who have particularly comparable indicators on informal work and uh, education of children from 2017 to 20, or that are representative by certain features. And to give a very simple example of this, and the need for better information, um, and in a sense, the demand from actors outside academia. If you think of the interagency expert group on the sustainable development indicators, there are a number of working groups that are trying to take core indicators like SDGs and disaggregate them and think about how to disaggregate them rigorously, how to report those disaggregations. And in May of this year, there was a practical guidebook that the ADB came out with that was on data disaggregation. So there's a great deal of work on that, but curating existing multi-topic surveys would make it much easier to see what could be disaggregated by what. And so if there's a big gap in the ordinary source of statistics, you might be able to fill it with a statistic from a similar year from a different data source. So in this way, um, instead of focusing on existing measures and presuming those who make the measures would do all of the work of looking at and canvassing the other data sets, there might be a value in curating the data um, in, in a form of metadata, but meta metadata um, that would make it more accessible. So here are some um, of the desirable characteristics. For example, one might want to look at a particular question with a particular wording and response structure and know which um, other surveys have one particular question. Let's say that you are looking at um, if a particular migrant children complete a certain type of vocational training. Um, you also might want to look at comparable survey designs, i.e. those that can be disaggregated by certain topics or those that control for seasonality um, or those that are structured so as to be representative of a different group. You might want to simply say how many surveys are updated every one year and what do they have? And so you can understand what is, is feasible in different countries to update every one year. Or you might want to look at surveys that only last a certain number of minutes because you're interested in creating one in your country and you'd like to know what they have. But in a multidimensional poverty environment, you would also want to be able to dial up a group of indicators. Let's say you want to make a new measure with 10 indicators and want to find all surveys that have at least eight of them. Um, that could be an interesting you know, task to call into a, a, a curated database. Um, 
and also obviously geolocation, thinking about how that is geospatial keys and anchors are present in different surveys, particularly in the older ones, um, and, and the error, and trying to find ways of making assessments of non-sampling measurement error comparable and standardly reported, and not something that is embarrassing or um, not reported directly. And of course, this is primarily focusing on cross-section surveys, but of great interest are the many longitudinal surveys and understanding their periodicity, their attrition, um, their indicators, and their ways of assessing uh, and, and the, the, the length of period between them. So I think you get a sense of the ways that it seems it would be desirable to curate um, the existing data sets. Uh, and to some extent, they can be done. So here are an example of nine the portals, which do collect together sets of surveys. Um, and each of them have certain features of those surveys, um, which are, which they use. Uh, IPUMS is, is a very famous one for censuses, um, but the others are primarily household surveys and they're very, very useful, but they're limited in reach and they're not necessarily comparable with each other. And so while each gives some structure to the data landscape, they don't make the pre-pandemic corpus of relevant household survey data or census data available by the mentioned criteria. I'll put set census aside because IPUMS have, have done a great deal of, of new work on that. And so what this paper does is it just takes a first step at trying to landscape and see how difficult this is. And with Ushikan Gratnam and others, we've also done a separate exercise that we won't report on today of looking within the global MPI surveys at indicators that might be possible. Um, for example, when we were doing the revision in 2018 to extend the global MPI. And the criteria were that the, each survey had to cover at least three topics. We didn't ask comparability in those topics. And we asked that it be compared um, a comparable survey. And so we limited it to the surveys in the columns I don't know if you can see them, but it's DHS and MIX, um, the International Living Conditions Survey, the Living Standard Measurement Survey, um, the CWIPQ is the Core Welfare Indicators Questionnaire, and the World Health Survey that was only implemented once in 2003 for 72 countries. We looked at the number of waves and the earliest and the latest wave for each country. And I think uh, some of them have up to 34 or 35 uh, data points, but many, as you see, are much less. So if we turn first to the monetary poverty measures, um, these are much better cataloged in terms of just country coverage and updating, but perhaps not in terms of um, the specifics that I mentioned of recall periods, of number of questions, of time of the non-sampling measurement error. And we see that they basically began in 1980 um, at an international scale, and that now um, there are around 125 countries that have uh, comparable de developing countries that have these surveys. And this list is complete through the latest surveys that were entered in 2020. And that's on the left-hand side, which is the dark blue is the number of countries and the light blue is the total number of surveys. And you see it's almost become a linear increment um, through 2019, um, but with, uh, so it's the total number, the cumulative on the left side. And then on the right side is the number per year. And the dark blue are the number of new countries <clears throat> and the blue are the number of new surveys that were undertaken. And so you can see those patterns. Um, and you can see when some uh, survey work really got, got going in a, in, in a different way. Um, I can't see the year because of <laughs> Zoom, um, but you see the two tall dark stripes and when there, there was a burst of investment in household surveys. You also see that um, there what didn't seem to be after the SDG era started, when there was a promise of have a three by five, um, of having, sorry, of having, a greater frequency of updating of monetary surveys. It didn't seem 
to necessarily have occurred um, past 2017. If we turn to multidimensional surveys, um, <clears throat> this table just has the number of the different kinds of surveys. Um, so the demographic and health surveys that properly started in 1995 now cover 90 countries with 409 total surveys. And that's followed by the mix, which have a greater country coverage at 107 and 284. And mix, as you probably know, go periodically out in phases. And so there'll be a lot of countries that field in the same year, whereas DHS are much more steady across time. And then the living standard measurement surveys, the multi-topic surveys of the World Bank cover 36 countries and 132 data points. The core welfare indicator questionnaire, 24 countries and 51 data points. Um, the living conditions, 12 countries and the world health surveys um, are below. I can't see them. So that's just, and if we put it in the same format as the monetary surveys, we see an interesting pattern where they started later. They started in 1985, but in terms of country coverage, it's again around 125 countries, 127 countries. And in terms of the total number of surveys, it's just under a thousand and the monetary is over a thousand, but not a great deal. And so that means that although there's perhaps a lack of visibility um, of this corpus of data sets, there has been a very important increment. Um, on the right-hand side, you see the country coverage and, uh, sorry, the, the new countries that came on in the dark blue slides and the number of countries. And the high peaks are, as I mentioned, the years that the different mix phases went out. You also see that in 2020, um, there was a much, much fewer um, surveys were fielded in, in, of the multi-topic sort but that there was not otherwise a, a, a slowdown um, in the way that these are the monetary ones. And there had been a slowdown in terms of numbers of surveys after the SDG period, which was, I think, a little bit unexpected and is striking. So um, that just gives a sense um, of how dispersed the data are. And to go much further and touch on the points that I said would be very useful for data curation would be a very arduous and detailed task um, and not one to be underestimated. But I'll touch on a couple other uh, topics that we looked at in this paper with Matthew. One is we looked at what surveys are updated at least once a year and some of them more frequently, just to get a, a sense of the, the periodicity and how different countries were able to update the surveys often. And what you see is that many of those that were updated often are EU SOC surveys, the European Standards of <clears throat> Income and Living Condition surveys, but there are also a number of others. So the Brazil now has a continuous uh, with a rolling panel PENAD data set. Um, Costa Rica has an annual um, survey of the quality of life. Um, Ecuador has an, also an annual survey of quality of life, as does El Salvador. All of them make their national MPIs from those surveys. Um, and the it, Indonesia with Susanas actually updates its numbers four times a year, uh, as does Vietnam, and some update three times a year. So there are also within year updates that we haven't covered here. But these are examples of countries that show that more frequent surveys are possible. And so understanding the staffing structure where you have permanent staff in the field to do the surveys every year or understanding the costs and the incremental costs of different ways of having annual surveys could be interesting. But the first task is to get these information together. Another demand which has been very common during the pandemic has been the demand for shorter surveys. That is for surveys that could be fielded remotely by phone or that were cheaper and quicker. And what is interesting is if you look a little bit at the history of the household surveys is that this question has come up again and again, but that it has been discussed far more often perhaps than it has been implemented. 
Um, and there are interesting questions about why that is. But just to introduce some of the four most high profile examples, um, the Demographic and the Health Survey did a key indicator survey, KIS, with 20 indicators. And it was designed to be short and simple and to produce indicators that were comparable to those um, in the DHS from a nationally representative sample, but between the surveys. Um, it, all of the documentation was done, all of the questionnaire design was done, but it has not been implemented greatly. The core welfare indicators questionnaire of the World Bank was developed in the late 1990s to again have some questions more frequent than the living standard measurement surveys. And at the time of writing um, in the late 90s, that cost between 34 and $51 per survey. So it was also designed to be quite inexpensive and the core module took 40 minutes. And I've already introduced the SWIFT questionnaire, um, which is one underway and under dialogue and I'm sure others, James may have more recent updates. And then the interim DHS, which was the successor to the KIS survey. And again, a great deal of work was invested in it, but only four countries have regularly used it. Um, and one of the features seems to be that if a country is going to implement a survey, it ends up adding more questions. And so it ends up becoming longer. So this is in a sense what the paper covers, some nodes where we recognize demand for household survey information and some very preliminary steps towards gathering it. But I would think it's fair to say that from those preliminary steps, what we've recognized is that accurately curating existing multi-topic household surveys in a way that would be conducive to multidimensional studies, whether these are on poverty or other multidimensional phenomena, of which there are many, is a great deal of upfront investment. And it's something that is messy and difficult and requires very, very clear guidelines to bring surveys of very different types together in a common framework. We've tried to think through, inspired by the Atkinson Commission report, what would be some elements of that common framework. And we've tried to point out that the moment that the surveys went silent during the pandemic provides a very good landmark to look back over the existing corpus of household surveys and work to curate them. But because that work seems too vast for a group like ours, the paper ends simply there by calling for work that it does not itself attempt or complete. So thank you so very much. I think those are my 35 minutes. Great. So thank you so much, Sabina, um, for laying out the framework, for reiterating what, uh, what Tony had uh, told us in his book, um, raising more questions perhaps than answering but nonetheless uh, pointing the way. I'll turn it over to Yanshin to give her perspectives if she's next. Thank you very much, James. Uh, thanks very much, uh, uh, Sabina. I really enjoyed reading your paper and also listening to your presentation. I'm going to make uh, three uh, uh, suggestions or comments today. Uh, uh, first, uh, maybe just uh, uh, a suggestion on how to uh, forward this paper. Uh, I understood this paper was first written in 2018, but you and your co-author uh, just updated uh, the paper recently. Uh, but some contents of the paper might need to be updated as well, along with the annex appendix, which you already uh, showed us today, the updated table, very nice. I learned a lot from, uh, from, from, from that updated table. Um, just uh, uh, two, uh, two uh, uh, sub-suggestions. First, uh, you can consider making this document, this paper, a living uh, uh, document. Uh, uh, we increasingly see uh, uh, authors to this living document, living paper. So you constantly update it. Uh, I think this is one of the uh, type of papers uh, we can make it living one. Uh, second, you could consider making your uh, appendix A as a tracker. So you can uh, 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 create a tracker to uh, uh, monitor uh, the multi-topic service by country. Um, then, uh, uh, you know, readers can go to your website to get most updated uh, 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 information on 
uh, individual countries multi-topic uh, service. So this is the first comment. Uh, second, um, uh, I know this uh, stock taking uh, exercise is very, very uh, useful. Then readers can benefit from, 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 from it. Um, probably uh, it's also important to uh, be aware of other ongoing initiatives. I just want to share information. Uh, for example, at UN, we have an inter-secretarian working group on household service. Then last year, uh, August 2020, uh, it started uh, 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 create a task force uh, uh, trying to do a mapping exercise uh, uh, on how to take stock of the existing national intention service, household service, uh, either regularly or ad hoc. Um, because uh, this task force found uh, one third of SDG indicators, which is 80 out of uh, 232 indicators can be directly sourced from household service. So that's why uh, they want to pay a lot of attention, more attention now to household service. So I found your exercise and their uh, uh, you know, plan, planned exercise uh, have a, some overlaps. So I'm going to uh, uh, collect you with uh, this group of uh, 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 colleagues. So maybe uh, some collaboration can be, can be forged. The uh, second, uh, uh, in addition, you know, you, in your paper, in your presentation, you also mentioned this international household survey network. This is also one we often go to, to check the latest information on countries uh, survey. Then this, this uh, website has been updated uh, on, on a very uh, frequent basis. So now it has almost 9,000 uh, uh, surveys. So a lot of information, but exactly as Sabina said, how to uh, align this information, presenting a consistent picture to the readers is a, is a different uh, topic. So I think uh, Sabina and Matthew's paper uh, uh, is the right uh, 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 effort made uh, uh, to improve that, uh, that uh, alignment. And then the third comment is about importance and demand for rapid assessment on poverty estimates. So as this uh, epidemic uh, showed us, it's very important to have some sense of uh, uh, impact of uh, shock. Uh, this time is uh, epidemic. Then we had the uh, economic uh, crisis uh, 10 years ago. Then we had uh, Ebola crisis uh, a while ago. So working with what we have, uh, so we need to figure out what we can make sense of the uh, uh, current situation. So even though, uh, even now, we have very limited uh, survey data to review the true impact of the epidemic on poverty and other indi development indicators, but it doesn't stop researchers and us uh, from making uh, projections, estimates, because uh, we need this for our policy work. For example, a uh, very recent example, after uh, what happened in Afghanistan, uh, UNDP uh, uh, published a study three weeks after August 15th. So we tried to look at how this event could have impact the, the economy of the country and also uh, uh, impact the poverty. Then uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a simple CGE exercise. Um, then we, we, we have this uh, projected uh, 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 scenario analysis with the GDP falling by, you know, 13% uh, 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 by mid of 2022, then that will lead to 25 percentage point increase in poverty estimates, which will bring the country's poverty rate from 73 to 97 percent. So that's that's a very very alarming message. Uh, even though we know, um, you know, this uh, this uh, this uh, 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 poverty projection is very sensitive to assumptions and modeling techniques. Uh, so these projected poverty estimates are very volatile, but there's a definitely a demand for such a rapid uh, assessment appraisal after a shock hit. So what we can do uh, in the paper, uh, Sabina also mentioned uh, this short surveys or rapid surveys. So my opinion is going forward, uh, uh, academia like Oxford or I international organizations and national city offices need to work together 
and make an investment on the design and implementation of uh, high frequency service or rapid service to track the impact of shocks. So last time, uh, for example, during the 2008, 2009 economic crisis, at the time we discovered not many uh, places track the policy reactions after the crisis. So, uh, uh, but this time around, you see a lot of policy trackers uh, started emerging, uh, presenting a lot of useful information on how individual countries respond to uh, the shock in terms of social protection, in, in terms of monetary and physical support measures. Uh, but uh, similarly, this time, uh, compared to the 2008, 2009 crisis, we still have very little uh, uh, information about the impact of the crisis on the ground. So whether we can do something together to make this uh, rapid or uh, called high frequency uh, surveys more available in more developing countries uh, is something I want to bring the question to uh, Sabina, but also to, 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 the, to, the, to, the, to the audience. Um, then this time, for example, when we were working on the global MPI report, we used the World Bank's high frequency phone surveys uh, to review the impact of pandemic in developing countries. Uh, probably uh, 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 my colleague, uh, Harry Berto will talk more about it. But such phone surveys, if we take the history as a, as a, as a, as a uh, 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 benchmark, we, we, we often observe such uh, phone surveys are often short, no, no longer than 20 minutes, and uh, uh, short-lived, which means these uh, phone surveys are only uh, used for one period of time, then deserted afterwards. So how can we make this uh, uh, rapid or high frequency surveys keep running and become a tool for monitoring, a continuous monitoring on uh, indicators like poverty or other uh, health and education indicators. is something I think uh, uh, the whole uh, global development community needs to uh, work more on and make more investment on. These are my three uh, comments. I will uh, hand it to James. All right, I'll take it and then I'll pass it right over to Harry Berto. Thank you, James. Uh, thank you, Sabina and, and Matthew. Congratulations for the, for the work. I, I, I think it's a, a very solid stock taking um, exercise uh, that gives us um, a very good view of the situation today uh, and pre COVID, but also um, some of the recent history, which I think it's, uh, it's very interesting. As uh, Yan Chung uh, was mentioning, um, I think a natural uh, next step would be to, to expand this to, to what happened with, um, with COVID, because even though there is a, a setback, as Sabina mentioned, also there are some interesting new developments, uh, like um, the survey she just mentioned, the <clears throat> high frequency phone surveys, but also what, uh, UNICEF is doing with the uh, mix plus. I think that's something um, interesting that need to be that needs to be uh, considered. I think in a, in a in a next uh, revision of the paper. Um, and about the the messages of the paper, even though Sabina says that there are big messages, but I think there are. Uh, I think uh, one of them is that we have had a lot of progress. Uh, over the last uh, decades with respect to the situation in the late 20th century. Uh, and I think that's, uh, that's quite uh, remarkable. But at the same time, we see that we are reaching um, a plateau, some limits. Now, these limits uh, have to do with um, our availability to surveys, um, but also it's a limit uh, in terms of uh, our ability to respond to some of the data needs of the of the current moment in, in, in history. And then we have been talking a, a little bit about this before. Uh, so to what extent um, this, uh, some of the um, indicators that we are extracting from the surveys, most of them uh, related to extreme poverty are what we need in order to to see the struggles of people that uh, what they are facing currently. 
Uh, some of those are related to some crisis like the pandemic, but there might be other factors uh, that um, are at play. So this is a, a, an overall question. I, I think we should reflect uh, on that and I, I will come back to that uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a moment. But, so, but then the question is how to push the frontier. And, and I think I would ask three questions to, to Sabina, but are, these are questions for, for all of us. And she partially responded some. So the first one is would be um, how to make uh, better use of existing data, and this I think this is a core a question in the paper. Uh, a second question is how to expand the availability of um, multi-topic data, and the third question uh, is how to push uh, for a new generation of, of data. And I and I will go over these three questions with uh, some some further provocations for. Uh, for Sabina, so something that is very uh, in, interesting in the in this paper is this um, uh, statement that uh, in some uh, I'm, I'm going to read a quote, uh, but uh, in some cases funds are invested in multi-topic household service that are never fully analyzed, and Sabina reiterated these different and the same points in time. So there is a potential to do more with the data that is uh, available. And I think uh, uh, maybe Sabina doesn't say it mu too much uh, because of modesty, but the multidimensional poverty index, uh, the global multidimensional poverty index uh, was an initiative that it took data that was there, dispersed, constructed, uh, for other purposes. And out of that, uh, OFI and, and UNDP were able to, to construct this global measure covering the situation of most developing countries. So that was a remarkable exercise of being able to use something that was already there, that wasn't being fully used and take it to the next level. So something important there is that was a sense of purpose. There was, a, uh, there was the sense that the existing measures of poverty were not good enough. So I think, and this element is what we need to bring now, uh, precisely because it, this is not only about uh, finding a new survey to just uh, improve a little bit the reliability of the frequency, even those are important goals, we also need to push ourselves to, to find new responses to, to, to crucial issues. When another inter inter interesting example uh, is recently uh, some efforts uh, in terms of the uh, multidimensional multi vulnerability index, which again, uh, they took different surveys that uh, were constructed for a different, different purposes and some colleagues, uh, some of them in, in OFI, uh, have been uh, constructing uh, new indices. So I think this is uh, something uh, very important uh, to, to, to keep this, this, sense of, uh, this, this sense of purpose. Now, uh, but what else can we do? Question for Sabina, uh, but uh, I think uh, there is a, a space in terms of the further integration of databases. Um, we see in the case of um, income poverty data, and now um, some colleagues in the Warring Equality Lab, they are um, integrating national uh, data from household with uh, national accounts and also with uh, administrative data. In, in, in the case of multidimensional poverty, I think there is a lot of space to integrate um, household surveys with um, other geolocalized data. And I think that's something that uh, we can, and, and I think we need to cover more ground in terms of what's happening with uh, um, conflict, what's happening with the environment. Uh, and I think there is a, a lot of uh, potential there in terms of the concept that we need to uh, capture. Um, and also, I think there is a space for uh, further uh, modeling, interpolation, extrapolation. I think uh, 
uh, we can say more uh, with the with the structure we already have and, and based on the learning over the last few years. About the second question, uh, how to expand the availability of, I would say, combinable and multi-topic data. Uh, I think it would be important also to 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 see uh, what uh, what can be done in terms of uh, being able to capture other things, uh, let's say subjective indicators and also uh, indicators of, that are represent more the deprivations, uh, more relevant in today's world. Um, things that are not just the basic things are uh, are the next step in development, but that are still important. And here, uh, I think the paper is very good, uh, precisely um, pointing out how to create these databases. But uh, the, my question to Sabina would be, what could be uh, the next step in order to push in the institutional boundaries? Um, what we can do, and also in addition to what Jan Shun was saying, to, uh, to make sure that we can combine databases. So is maybe it's a matter of just making sure that there is a module, a demographic module that is um, standard, standardized in order to allow us to combine this database and what, what would it take to, to get there. And finally, uh, the third question would be uh, how we can push uh, a new generation of, of data. And, and, and this is an open question in terms of, um, I mean, in the context of uh, a moment where, when the, the largest companies in the world have to do with technology and the value of data, whether this new situation also should change the way we think uh, uh, about, um, about data. And this, uh, here there are questions of whether we can use there is some space of use, some of that infrastructure of these uh, large companies to, to bring some, some data that we can combine. Or if not, uh, if there is any process in the way we think about data that we can bring uh, to the production of uh, our databases, thinking about that, how think of the how, for instance, uh, in these companies is so important the use of the data. The, so the fact that there are new technologies, artificial intelligence that can automatically use the data that is produced and that also makes the production and, and productivity of the data uh, much higher. The questions, uh, I'm gonna stop here, but uh, thank you for the opportunity and congratulations again to, to Sabina Mathi. Great, so um, I think we've had, um, three and three put forward. And therefore the speaker, and if he's there, the co-author could, uh, <laughs> could attempt to respond to them. But in the meanwhile, anyone who's in the audience who has questions that are, are remaining in your mind, remember we do have the Q and A um, function there that can be addressed um, or even chat for some folks. Uh, please go ahead, Sabina. Thank you so much. I've been taking notes like mad and these are fantastic comments. Um, in terms of making it a living paper or a tracker, Yanshin, I'd love to, and I don't know how, but um, if you have suggestions, I'll, I'll check with Matthew um, Robson, who I believe is on the call, um, but I think that would be a really interesting um, next step. Um, and similarly, in terms of the ongoing initiatives, the inter Secretariat on Household Surveys, um, it would be very, I think it's essential to try to, to link up and to learn what they're doing because we can't do it, for example, in a small research center, but maybe we could, um, uh, yeah, share some suggestions about how, what they could do in terms of the multi-topic data environment. Um, and then it would prevent overlaps. And IHSN, we used to be very deeply engaged with, now less so, but it's, is always an ever improving place. And I think it's very good in terms of trying to bring some kind of standardization to the, the survey environment. Um, and your third point was just really, really exciting. Um, and there are some people on this call, of course, who are very knowledgeable about that. But I would say that I certainly would have a very, very clear hope that we could collaborate and 
pull out a, a brief survey module that um, could be done probably replacing nutrition with food security, um, but that could be done in a rapid remote way and perhaps adding quick questions on informal employment and some other things, but that would capture the essence of an MPI, um, but on the telephone and could be something that could be used in, in different environments in this post COVID and ongoing COVID um, period. So that would be something we, we have the questions from the DHS already pulled out, but it would be very good to, to have a talk and see if there were any ways we could support um, international agencies and others doing these rapid remote surveys to use some of the global MPI questions as close as is feasible. Um, and in, I, I really like also the idea of continuous monitoring uh, because that and mix plus and those, those, those uh, innovations because uh, for a multidimensional measure where you need uh, updated data, but for the same household, uh, they could be really very, there are potential uh, high impact innovation. And similarly, I really valued your comments, Herberto. And um, in terms of how to make better use of existing data, I think that's one thing that certainly weighs on me that there must be lots of surveys in addition that we could look at in interesting ways. Um, for example, using additional indicators or whatever. And so that would be a, um, a an, an interesting um, thing. But I, I liked your point about the need to integrate databases um, and to then think about integrating it with administrative data um, as the BIID does, um, but also with geolocalized data of conflict and of the environment. That's sort of an essential next step that has to happen um, and it has to be done very well, but very deliberately and concretely. Um, and in terms of modeling, and I know not Narden Baker's on this call and there are people who are exploring different ways of modeling in addition to Ricardo and Nicolai Supa who have been you know, leading it from our side. But I think there's a lot of interesting work on that that will probably bring learning in the next couple of years. Um, and then expanding it to combine with subjective data or um, other kinds of data sources, thinking about combining it. I think these are the questions of the moment. And the only thing that I would like is I observe in other fora, other kinds of data sets are innovating very quick, but perhaps these, you know, multi-topic household surveys are not at the forefront and not benefiting as much as, as we could from the real um, advances in the uh, Global Data Forum and in other kind of um, fora like that. And so I think it, it would be very good to keep having this conversation together and, and with others on the call um, and think of, of ways of, of trying to advance this. But who will actually curate the data and will they go to the level of real detail that would be so useful for researchers in the future as a common public good? I think that that's a still a standing question. So back to you, James. Thanks a lot. Um, I did have a, a question. You were just jumping right in on subjective there. Uh, what is the current state in subjective poverty discussion? Because, I mean, we recently had Martin Burt, of course, come along with his stoplight, which is in essence a subjective exercise guided by some touchstones. Uh, I'm just wondering if you have any insight there and how that translates into uh, something beyond just uh, uh, something of interest, but to, uh, to actual research? I think it's not a topic that we've looked at um, in, in the same depth. And so there, you know, there, I think there's, there's a lot of work to be done to, to unpack it. Some of the questionnaires we use do have subjective questions. And so there's space to jointly analyze multidimensional poverty and answers of uh, evaluative life satisfaction or of um, satisfaction with different domains of life. And I think that would be very interesting to do and see what these relationships are, but it's not an area of work that we have innovated on. Uh, again, I don't know who else on the call might've done so, and I'm aware that people on this call might have, but it's not something that I'm aware of. How, um, just uh, out of curiosity, Sabina, uh, moving from subjective 
to, to other types of domains where there's been lots and lots of effort combining data sets. Uh, the inequality domain has now you know, become very popular. It's all pure income or consumption uh, in some cases, but there has been this incredible you know, consolidation of data sets and evaluation and so on. Um, do you see that as an example to follow or are there things that have gone wrong there when it comes to multi-topic? I see the need for a parallel endeavor, but in a multi-topic environment. And so it will be different because we don't have tax data uh, of the same kind. Uh, but there is the, the relation, the complications they have with the national accounts and the household survey data are not the same. Um, but the, the need to bring together the administrative data with comparability issues and the household survey to have their own issues and, and then to manage these is, is important and it's an area of experimentation in, in many other ways. But I think to do it in a sense for a set of variables at the same time in a quite a structured way is something that is perhaps not being undertaken um, in a joined up way. And that's where I think it would be very useful to have you know, a locus just like there is the WIID um, that's really focused on that for multi-topic data, multi-topic data sources and trying to bring together different sorts of data and experiment. We can do it with academic papers or the odd thing, but um, there's the need also to create data sets that then others can study. Um, and, and that's a, a great deal of work, particularly less for some variables and more for others. I think an easier, easier ones to start with would be electricity or housing materials. You know, some of those would be more straightforward, um, but not completely straightforward by any means, even those. I had uh, noted with uh, you know, uh, interest the discussion of big data or big data companies out there. You know, in the old days when I was a kid and the television station was the big information uh, source for everybody, uh, one of the things that governments did to allow these wonderful companies to exist and to broadcast and to sell us you know, all kinds of cookies and breakfast cereals was to, uh, in, to dedicate a part of the time that they broadcast to public service. In other words, public service announcements would come up, there'd be different programming that was required as a kind of tax. It strikes me that there hasn't been much discussion of how to make use of these big data companies in a way that would benefit folks like yourself, who through very, very simple amounts of data that could come through the pike as part of the, uh, you know, the agreement as you keep doing what you're doing, but you have to provide this public good. Uh, it just seems like it hasn't been a real, real discussion issue. Has it been, uh, or am I missing something here? And why the heck not? I don't know of it at all. I don't know, Yan Chun or Harry, if you do. Um... Are there any initiatives with UN or with governments that are sort of thinking through this idea of a, you know, a more holistic public good way of looking at data that would require a tax, if you will, or a payment for being able to access customers that you also provide a service to all of us. Yeah, uh, so I don't know of any like um, systematic effort. Um, we have been trying to, to learn how to use it. Um, so, that would be maybe some of the first steps to, to then request or try to channel this data. Uh, but we are still in these baby steps and trying to do MOUs to get data and to, to learn how to use it. But I think it's gonna take a little bit of time because also the, the nature, uh, I mean, how they structure the data is not exactly compatible with the way we think about data. So we need to validate things. They, they produce data that they, and they change the standards uh, from, from one moment to the other. They don't need to give any explanation. So uh, I think uh, we need to bridge uh, this world, but I think certainly uh, there is a lot of work to, to be done. So yeah, the... is, uh, sorry, Go ahead, Go ahead uh, Yanchen, I please. Sorry, I, I, I don't think at the UN we have a systematic uh, approach to that, but I heard initiatives here and there uh, to uh, collaborate with companies like Google, Microsoft, 
uh, to make use of some some of the the big data they 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 they, they have. Um, in in my last post, I was uh, 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 in charge of the commodities program um, uh, at the UN uh, uh, trade organization. Then uh, I was based in Geneva. Then, as we know, Geneva is a commodity trading hub. So uh, our commodity trading firms has much, much more data regarding commodities, revenues, trade, uh, uh, even production, you know, in developing countries uh, better than international organizations. Um, but how to uh, 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 ask them to share the data with, uh, with us, with the public, is a, is a very, very challenging uh, uh, task. But over the past seven years I was stationed there, I gradually see the, the, the progress the progress. Uh, big commodity uh, companies like, uh, you know, uh, uh, Glencore and uh, Trevi they started coming to uh, the, uh, the, 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 the conferences called uh, by OECD, UN, they started uh, talking more instead of just uh, showing up, uh, uh, sitting there, they started talking more, they started talking about the possibility of sharing more data voluntarily. So I think going forward, uh, there's uh, definitely more opportunity for, 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 for public to tap on this uh, private data, large uh, amount of uh, private data. Well, that's, that's very interesting to hear that from you. And I know Matthew has got uh, a comment to make on that. Are you, are you live, Matthew? Can you speak up? Uh, Go ahead. <laughs> yeah, sorry. I'm like, yeah, um, so I think one one question, um, so thanks for all the comments, it's been really great. Um, I think one question is on the integration of um, big business uh, and the data collecting capacities they have, of, you know, places like Google and um, with the kind of ethical side of this. Um, so I think one of, we've seen kind of in the pandemic, a huge rise in local data collected, GPS tracking and um, kind of proximity to others. Um, but I suppose one question is, is the reason that the multi-topic multi surveys are slower because of that ethical dimension? Um, because we need consent, we need um, you know, to consider some of these questions which relate to poverty in much more um, depth and detail and take a lot of care with this. Um, so I just would just just a general kind of thought there is the way of ensuring we have this ethical domain um, to be sensitive and taking enough time while increasing the rapidity and um, availability of this data. Yeah, there's a fundamental difference between the gathering of data that is not um, essentially uh, stated as such and the ethical dimensions that are behind uh, the problems that many of the companies are facing right now and will continue to face in the future since the entire business model is based on uh, the inadvertent uh, supply of data by uh, interacting participants who are making use of whatever it is that uh, is being provided by the big company. The, the idea here would be to actually take a page right out of what we do and make that statement for the purposes of collecting this and that, would you be willing to this, that, or the other? Can you imagine if if this popped up once in a while on your computer? You know, it. it, it I know it'll be totally uh, non-random uh, and so forth as to who answers and so on. But the idea of getting a quick one-two from folks who know that they're providing information, um, it it'll be a different uh, a different world. I, I assume if immediate feedback could be obtained and periods of uh, uh, like what we've seen in the last last few years with the pandemic. So anyway, uh, that is just an idea out there. Any other comments before we bring it to a close, folks? And anyone who is uh, in the panel, go ahead and say if you have anything or shake your head, wave your hands. Right. Well, I think I've got some quiet folks there. So I'll continue to be quiet myself and say thank you once again for joining us here and discussing all these uh, multi-dimensional uh, aspects of data. Um, please join us next week uh, when we come back again here in Washington, DC, New York, and Oxford. Thank you. <laughs>